I'm pretty bitter. It's been a shitty week. It really has. I got a throat culture going. It's just marvelous. That's because there's no weather anymore. Remember, there used to be seasons. It used to be fun. It used to be consistent. Now, on any given day, you wake up, you don't know what the fuck to expect. It could be 110 tomorrow. It could be two below. <laughs> Top it off, it's down tank day. <laughs> That holiday, that's just bullshit. That is a bullshit holiday. That was invented by a Jewish mother. It's the middle of February. Do you love me? And going out with people, you know, you're out there in the middle of a card store and people are like fucking psychotic. And then you're reading them. And then I saw her wonderful shine and it would be a great line. And so, you read the sex in his fucking cards. But it, it's just been hideous. My name's Lou Black, by the way. I'm here. I'm the warm-up act. Job, obviously, I relish. But I found out that the only way that you can warm up New Yorkers was to truly be more bitter than they could ever possibly be. <laughs> Uh, I also am the playwright in residence here, which is obviously a major fucking break for me. <laughs> because I do not have to deal with the National Endowment for the Arts. I deal directly with the New York State Liquor Control Board. <laughs>
G with a double E. I go back the hunt for getting to the name of the man they call a Russian McGee. Now, maybe you haven't uh, purchased my series of cassettes or my book, Singing Through Intimidation. <laughs> Tonight, I really demand everybody's participation because Rusty never sleeps. So when I say, let me hear you say, oh, oh. you better say, oh. Where 
is really dead. Let's go up to St. Mark's. Buy foreign coffee, percolator, and vaporizer. Ionizer, humidifier. See your heroes get old. I don't know how many of you happened to catch the uh, the Rolling Stones last fall at Shea Stadium. <laughs> Sponsored by mega beer conglomerate Anheuser Busch. The Stones sold out all over the country. <laughs> yeah, they sold out, all right. <laughs> I went and saw them at Shea, and I was amazed because it was a uh, 247 years of rock and roll experience up on that stage. No, average stone age, 47.3. Average stone wife age, 17.6. But I watched Mick and Keith and Ron and Bill and Charlie cranking out the old hits one more time, and raking in the books, and it made me reconsider my thoughts on euthanasia. So right now I'd like to do my tribute to the Stones. What a drag it is getting alone. Two, three, four.
Morris died recently, and really the death went un-eulogized. And so I thought tonight, uh, since I've been given this space, I would share a tribute to this dear old friend of all of ours. Say goodbye to a friend that we love. Raise your glasses high and mourn the death of the album. <laughs> the record album. The 33 and a third long playing album. Has it really come to pass? Can the album really be dead? I'm afraid so, folks. It means a lot to me because, hell, I was born just around the same time that the album really started to take off. It was the late 50s. Rock and roll was on everybody's mind. We were tired of clunky old 78 RPM records made of lacquer or varnish. Who knows what they were made of? Who cares? They were old and unwieldy. We wanted something new, more technological. We wanted high fidelity. High five. And we got it in the form of the 33 and a third Dynagroove long playing stereophonic diamond stylist record album. The long play for short, the LP. 12 inches of hot wax or vinyl, whatever it was made of, it was cool. You know? <laughs> the dimensions of the album were perfect, 12 inches by 12 inches, one square foot of music. When I was a senior in college, if I needed to measure my room for a rug or something, I used to lay records on the floor. <laughs> Because I knew each one was one foot long. <laughs> oh, the LP. To our parents, they were a novelty. To today's youth, they're a non-entity. But to us, they were a necessity. In the late 50s, they started off as soundtrack recordings, jazz recordings, and compilations of rock and roll singles. But our albums grew up just like we did. And by the 1960s, your albums made a personal statement about yourself. You know, owning a copy of Cream's Disraeli Gears said a lot about you as a person. It made a much different statement than, say, if you owned the latest Partridge Family record. <laughs> Hours of time spent in record stores wondering whether to blow my $4.98 hard-earned cents on Led Zeppelin II or the latest Grateful Dead. But once I got home, me and millions of other teenage music connoisseurs would share the same ritual. First of all, there was the... The shrink wrap, the tightly wrapped plastic around the record, was usually impossible to get off with your, uh, with a Gillette razor or an X-Acto blade, so you would use your fingers, you'd dig them in and have blood spurt from underneath your fingernails. And then there was one of the great questions of the mid to late 20th century, do you leave the shrink wrap on or off the record? Now if you leave it on, it'll keep the record protected, but there are those who swear that it'll warp your record. I think I broke up with three different girlfriends over this argument alone. How many people would leave the shrink wrap on? Let me see hands. Let me see bloody fingernails. How many people would take it off? Yeah. Funny, I was a lever honor. But over the years, the shrink wrap came off of most of my records, either out of deference to a living companion or sometimes just out of sheer boredom. Once you got the record open, the sensations would continue. The smell, the touch of the new record. Polyvinyl chloride to smell better than mimeograph paper or gasoline or vanilla. <laughs> oh, many would salivate in Pavlovian response at the sheer joy of the purchase. And then the ritual would continue, and I don't care if you owned a $1,500 Harman Kardon or KLH stereo component system, you'd follow the same ritual even if you owned a tinny speaker record player with a picture of Felix the Cat on the tone on it. You'd blow the dust off the needle. You put the record on and play and listen. And you read the back of the record album, greedily devouring the contents, the same way you greedily devoured the contents of a bowl of Lucky Charms earlier that day for breakfast. <laughs> I should write for the Wonder Years. <laughs> oh, the record album, it's the perfect size for, 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 for album art, unlike the puny cassette. You know, we didn't have a lot of video back in those days, so sometimes our only information we could glean about our rock and roll heroes was on these records canvas for psychedelic art, or liner notes for jazz enthusiasts, or even just clues to whether Paul was dead or not. <laughs> and then there was the true homage to Excess, the double album, like the Beatles' White Album, or Tommy by The Who, or even triple albums, like Woodstock was a triple album. 
But I think the best use for double albums was separating the herb from the seed. <laughs> you know, you could use a fold-out album for that as well, but uh, funny thing about fold-out records like uh, Crosby, Stills & Nash or Sgt. Pepper, you had to take the shrink wrap off of them. <laughs> and sure, when you listen to your, your albums, there was surface noise, there was wow and pop and flutter, and there were scratches. But every scratch was a story. And our records bore the scars of love. The sound of a needle scratching across the record was the epitome of our generation. We were young, we were mobile, we wanted our freedom. If it wasn't our song, we didn't want to sing it, let alone hear it. Once again, the technology has reared its ugly head, not to mention the fickle will of the people and greedy record executives. And we have demanded a new technology. First, we had the little cassette. You know, like to take to the beach, right? <laughs> and then the compact disc. Huh. You know, like for my BMW, I can't play record in my Beamer, you know? <laughs> oh, I, I better say. <laughs> the CD, the perfect yuppie toy, little, sterile, and expensive. <laughs> what do they call that classic Beatles album now, the white CD? <laughs> <laughs> Sure, there's no surface noise, no scratches, no soul. Let us cling to our past. Let us cherish our records like decaying frescoes in Italian museums. Let us cherish them and our heritage. You know, I celebrate a birthday of sorts when the planet spins 33 times in four months around the sun, my 33 and a third birthday. And on my 33 and a third, I remember the 33 and a third, the record album, the LP. You know, most record stores don't have records anymore. Only CDs and cassettes. <laughs> but before you go out and blow all your money on compact discs, just remember what happened to 8-track. <laughs> I feel that Springsteen is the second coming of Jesus. And so I have devoted my life to Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> no, if you don't believe me, listen to the lyrics of Bruce's songs. One, two, three, four! Which is the blood of my body Go out and spread my word Till everyone has heard Of my daddy's grace and glory I have no cross to bear My love is everywhere I only drove it from New Jersey To tell you to have faith Oh, did I not say I would rise from the dead And do a 1990 world tour Into your hands I commend my spirit Sometimes wears a beard. 
Jesus critics crucified him, and Bruce's critics will crucify him if he ever puts out a bad record. And they almost did for New Jersey. Jesus had a band of followers. Bruce has the E Street Band. Jesus was born on the dusty, remote outskirts of the Roman Empire. And Bruce was born in New Jersey. <laughs> Kennedy had a vice president named Johnson. Lincoln had a vice president named Johnson. <laughs> life story of the Bible that sold millions of copies as had Bruce's records, cassettes, and CDs. Jesus would have loved softball if it had been invented because Bruce loves softball. A lot of people think Jesus is the Son of God. A lot of people think Bruce is God. The vowels in the name Bruce, U and E. The vowels in the name Jesus. Think about it. <laughs> and finally, Jesus healed the sick and helped the blind to see. And Bruce, he sang on We Are the World. <laughs> Feels good, baby.